Good evening, everyone. We begin the readout tonight with the continued fallout over Russian atrocities in Ukraine. Today, the White House unveiled a severe new round of punitive measures aimed squarely at Putin's regime. That includes full sanctions on two Russian banks, effectively blocking their access to the U.S. financial system. President Biden is also prohibiting all Americans from making any new investments in the Russian Federation. And he's now targeting Putin's daughters, as well as the families of top Kremlin officials, freezing their assets in the U.S. The administration has also authorized another $100 million worth of lethal military aid to Ukraine, which will arrive in a matter of days. This comes as the Justice Department cracks down on Russian cybercrime, announcing yesterday that they've shut down the largest criminal marketplace in the world, which was based in Russia. They've also disrupted a major malware attack planned by Russian military intelligence. And they're working with international partners to investigate Russian war crimes. Meanwhile, having failed to meet their objectives in the north, Russian forces are pulling back to regroup for a new offensive in eastern Ukraine. But as they complete their retreat from the suburbs of Kyiv, they're revealing scenes of horror in their wake. And let's just be clear. Putin's senseless slaughter is of no strategic benefit to Russia. It serves no military purpose. It only proves the depths of Putin's depravity. Today, President Biden spoke about the atrocities in Bucha, where Russian forces deliberately massacred the civilian population. I'm sure you've seen the pictures from Bucha and out, just outside of Kyiv. Bodies left in streets as Russian troops withdrew. Some shot in the back of the head with their hands tied behind their backs. Civilians executed in cold blood. Bodies dumped into mass graves. A sense of brutality and inhumanity left for all the world to see unapologetically. There's nothing less happening than major war crimes. Responsible nations have to come together to hold these perpetrators accountable. We're also getting new images from another war-torn city, 15 miles from Bucha, where Russian forces targeted buildings that civilians used as shelters. Here's NBC's Richard Engel. Unfortunately, what these rescue workers are doing is not looking for survivors. They were shelters under these buildings. That building, another building right here. And local officials don't know exactly how many people were in the shelters, but they say hundreds at least, most of them women and children. And when these buildings came down, all the debris blocked access to the shelters, entombing them effectively. The Kremlin is justifying these horrors in the name of the so-called denazification of Ukraine. And yet it is now clear that no regime of this century better resembles the Third Reich than Putin's Russia. To that point, we've seen the Kremlin embrace genocidal rhetoric in state-run media outlets. That includes a recent op-ed that brazenly calls for the lustration and leadership and a significant part of their population. That article was so incendiary. President Zelensky said it should be used as evidence against Russia in a future war crimes tribunal. The extent of the Kremlin's atrocities underscores their depraved and historic indifference toward human life. We've seen that in Russia's eight-year war in the Donbass, which has killed more than 14,000 people. We saw it when pro-Russian militants downed Malaysian flight MH17 over Ukraine's border with Russia in 2014, killing everyone on board. But there's an even longer and darker history behind all of this. Because we are seeing, what we're seeing today is reminiscent of the 1933 Russian genocide in Ukraine known as the Holomador. That's when Joseph Stalin purposefully starved to death upwards of four million Ukrainians under his policy of forced collectivization. Joining me now is Julia Davis, columnist for The Daily Beast, and Dr. Chile Abel Osuji, former president of the International Criminal Court, professor of law at Stanford University, and author of International Law and Sexual Violence in Armed Conflicts. Dr. Um, Abel Usuji, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you being here. I want to allow you for a moment to listen to Secretary of State Antony Blinken commenting not just on the atrocities, but on, on the documenting of them because there are journalists there. This is, in, in some ways, the most documented war in real time that we've experienced because of technology, because of, of, of smartphones, because of the incredible courage of reporters uh, who remained in Ukraine. 
But even so, there are things that we're not seeing in real time, including Butra. And it's only when that tide recedes that you see what's actually happened. So I think we're going to learn a lot more in the days and weeks ahead. I'm afraid that what we're going to learn is um, even more horrifying. And, sir, President Zelensky has called for a Nuremberg-style trial um, over the atrocities that we've seen. Can that happen? And in your view, will that happen? Yes, that can happen if there is a resolve on the part of the international community to see it happen. It's about the political will to do it. Um, there are two ways it, it can happen as we speak. Um, there are four crimes known in international law. You have the crime of genocide, you have crimes against humanity, you have war crimes, and then you have the crime of aggression. The first three, except the crime of aggression, uh, can already be engaged because of what's happening on the Ukrainian territory. The International Criminal Court would have jurisdiction to try those three crimes. Genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, where there's evidence to prove that. Where the ICC cannot try because of the veto power that Russia has at the United Nations Security Council is the crime of aggression because uh, the, the big powers made sure that the International Criminal Court would not have independent jurisdiction over the crime of aggression unless the UN Security Council refers such a case to the ICC where the culprit, so to speak, is not a member state of the Rome Statute and Russia is not that. So you will not have the Security Council referring the crime of aggression to the ICC because Russia is not a state party. But the other three, war crimes, crimes against humanity and uh, genocide, if there's uh, proof of that, the ICC can have jurisdiction over that. So it is possible to have trials for those three already. Now, about the crime of aggression, it requires the setting up of a special tribunal, which I understand some leaders, global leaders, are now uh, making the move for. So that's, in a nutshell, the run, of, uh, the, uh, uh, the run of things relating to your question whether mm -hmm. it can happen. Yes, it can happen. And one just follow-up question. Um, would evidence that Russia has, or its leadership, has expressed the desire to end the existence of Ukraine, um, has deported hundreds of thousands? They claim 600,000 Ukrainians have been brought inside Russia. I assume they cannot leave, including lots of children. The idea that they claim Ukraine doesn't exist. This, this Canadian Broadcasting the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation actually, you know, sort of ran um, a, a translation of this op-ed that ran in Russia that justified erasing the Ukrainian identity. Um, it claims that the word Ukraine itself is synonymous with Nazism and cannot be allowed to exist. Um, a former Canadian ambassador, ambassador to Ukraine said it essentially is the rhetorical license to kill. They're essentially erasing the identity of Ukrainian people. Is that evidence, in your view, of genocide? Definitely serious evidence of intent to commit genocide if you, um, depending on, it depends on who said it. If there's the, the, the genocide is more uh, a crime of intent, really. Uh, 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 let's say it focuses a lot on intent to destroy a national group, racial group, religious group, or ethnic group, mm. the destruction of that group in whole or in part. Uh, makes the crime of genocide. So once that intent is there, mm -hmm. uh, you do not need to kill the whole lot of people for you to have a crime of genocide. Um, evidence like that, if it is shown on the, anybody who has killed anyone had that intent, you have yourself a serious case of genocide to be tried. Yeah. Indeed. And so, Julia, talk a little bit about what you're seeing and hearing on Russian state TV, because one must presume that what you're hearing on Russian state TV is what the Kremlin wants said. Therefore, they agree with it. You've been tweeting about and reporting about some of the really horrific things that they're saying. Tell us about those. 
There has been a continuous drumbeat that sounds definitely like a genocidal language. They repeatedly say, including Russian lawmakers that are in position to make decisions to uh, speak to members of the military, they're constantly saying that Ukraine does not need to exist. Even a small part of it cannot be allowed to remain. They say the same about Ukrainian identity, about Ukrainian language. And the article that you referenced specifically said that even though Ukraine does not have Nazi government, it does not have Nazi laws, they have decided to be creative about it and simply say that anyone who wants to be independent of Russia is a Nazi. That would certainly explain their behavior in Bucha, where they killed random civilians, probably because they did not embrace the Russian rule. And that is what I'm hearing on their state media. And also what is extremely disturbing, they are already predicting that these so-called provocations will be repeated. So that means there are more atrocities that are yet to be uncovered, and they already know what they've done. They're already preparing their audiences that there will be more to come out.